and we look forward to the opportunity to share with you again uh, some truths that will encourage you and prepare you for the next stop in your Christian life. Uh, many of us may or may not realize what's about to happen to us. And the next thing that happens to you and to me once we leave here, if you're a Christian, if you're born again on your way to heaven, the next thing that happens in your life is to meet Jesus and to give an account of the things that you've done in this body, whether it's good or bad. And uh, that's an exciting time, and we should all be looking forward to that moment. So this morning, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. If you wouldn't mind standing with me as we read the Word of God this morning, I'm going to read a verse together this morning, and uh, then we'll spend some time together uh, from Thessalonians. We should all be familiar with these passages, shouldn't we? Yeah. All right. Verse 10. We'll read one verse here, and then we'll, we'll get to our, our time. And to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for the privilege you give us to gather together this morning. Use this time to encourage us and prepare us uh, for the week ahead, and Lord, for the opportunity to meet you one day, uh, maybe even very soon. Uh, Lord, we look forward to that time. Help us, Lord, uh, to uh, be ready. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You men, you may be seated. The title of our time together, if you're one of those people who needs a title or you take notes and you want to write things down, uh, what to do, what to do while you wait. What to do while you wait. Uh, again, that's not a question. It's really a statement. But, uh, you know, oftentimes in our life, we're often finding ourselves in positions we don't know what to do while we're waiting. Um, I don't know about you, but we've got kids in our house and uh, waiting for dinner is usually a very trying moment in our house. The kids just don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, so either they're, you know, uh, a swarming mom and she's trying to get things done and she can't get things done because she's got one kid on each leg, one kid in an arm and another one hanging off her back and she's trying to get dinner ready, right? Or other things are going on. So I always tell the kids, either you find something to do or I will find something for you to do. And uh, usually the something for you to do in, involves some elements of labor or elements of something that they don't want to do. So uh, they usually find something to do while they wait for dinner. And uh, their encouragement is always to make it a productive time because then you'll be nice and hungry and ready for the meal. You know, in the Christian life, again, uh, it's possible... Uh, that uh, prior to our series starting several weeks ago, that many of us were just literally oblivious to the fact that there's coming a day when we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And, and probably along with that, there's really not any understanding or, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say willingness, but uh, uh, there, there, there's not a whole lot of understanding as to what to do while you wait. Okay? What do we do while we wait for our, for our Savior, for that time when he comes in the clouds to call us, whether it's the, by way of the rapture or, or uh, by way of, of, of death, uh, however that comes. But what do we do while we wait? And we see in the, our text here this morning that Paul tells, uh, uh, the, the, uh, tells us through uh, 1 Thessalonians that uh, these Christians were doing stuff while they were waiting. Really, the statement here isn't a question. It's really a testimony of their life. Now, the unfortunate thing, I think, in modern day Christianity is what to do while we wait is just kind of hang on. We're just going to kind of go with the flow. Uh, we've heard it mentioned from the pulpit here before, but we just kind of be the status quo. We're not really looking to make a ripple in the community. We're not really looking to do anything extravagant. Uh, we're you know, really not looking to do anything out of the ordinary. We're just going to kind of hang on until the rapture happens. This is kind of what we call that mindset, the status quo. And uh, I, 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 don't, I don't want you to hang on until the rapture happens. I don't want you to live uh, the status quo Christian life. I don't believe Christ, uh, you know, the Lord Christ wants you to live a status quo Christian life. I, I believe now in the day and age in which we live is the greatest time in the history of, of humanity to be a Christian. This is the greatest opportunity to do things for the Lord. Uh, living a status quo Christian life is really not anything I think is what God would have us to do. So uh, and it's because if you're living in that uh, context of, listen, there's coming a time where I'm going gonna, 
I'm going to stand before the Lord. And again, <clears throat> standing before, Lord, before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ shouldn't be a time of agonizing worry. You shouldn't worry about having to see your Savior. You shouldn't fear that moment. Again, the judgment seat of Christ is not about your sin. Your sin has been judged on the cross. Amen. All your past sin, all your present sin, all your future sin. It's all been wiped away in the person of Jesus. When he shed his blood, when he, uh, when he was buried for three days, when he rose again victorious over sin, all of sin, death and hell. Okay, So it's all dealt with. So again, we're not talking about standing before the Lord, feeling ashamed for sinful behavior, and he's going to hold your sin out and make you feel like a fool in front of everybody. That's not the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is a time where you give an account for your faith life, your life as a Christian. Did you just live a status quo and there's, you come to the Lord uh, with having not taken any faith steps or lived in accordance to God's word? Or did you just, uh, or did, were you the kind of Christian who saw things in God's word and by faith you stepped out and, and did what, uh, what Christ had? That's the difference. And you shouldn't fear that moment. We should be excited. Paul was excited. He often said, I was, I'm ready to be with the Lord, but listen, I'm in a straight betwixt too. <laughs> I want to go to heaven, but at the same time, there's, you know, I want to be here with you. And uh, in my heart, I feel the same way. So let's look at two things this morning. Uh, that our text gives us on what to do until or while we wait, okay? What to do while we wait. Number one, you'll see in verse number six, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Number one, be a follower, okay? This word here is uh, a Greek word that we get, we would get our, the, you know, the, the, the hard translation would be mimic. We get our English word mimic or imitator. Okay, so the, 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 the key here, Paul's saying, ye became an imitator of us and of the Lord. So there's two things here that we want to see. Number one, being an imitator, uh, you want to imitate the right people. <laughs> you want to imitate the right people. Listen, you can turn on social media, you can turn on any facet of social media or any facet of news today, and you can find people who are making fools of themselves all over the place. They're imitating the wrong people, okay? But let me tell you something. When, it becomes, uh, when you become a follower, you become a follower of the right people. I would say this is the people of faith. Notice he says, ye became followers of us. Who's the us? Paul, si uh, Silvanus, and Timothy. These are men of faith, okay? Now, before we get into this here, let me just say this. Becoming a follower is a choice, It's a choice. And every day that you get up and every moment that you have to live for Christ, you have to make a decision. Who are you going to follow? Right. Who's going to impact your life? And listen, mom and dad can make choices for you. You know, the people, pastor and, the, and Sunday school teachers and the different people at church can make choices for you. But at the end of the day, it's a choice. And more than that, it's a personal choice. Who am I going to let impact my life that will ultimately direct me in a certain direction? Because the choice you make will lead you down a certain pathway. Listen, you can, you can choose to follow you know, sports figures, which, again, I wouldn't choose to follow a whole lot of sports figures today. Very few are worth following. Right. Okay? Uh, you can choose to follow people in the entertainment world. I'm having a hard time finding one, if any worth following there. Uh, you can go into the uh, political realm and find people there, maybe even some moral people, but still, are they worth following? You have to answer that question and answer that question for your own self. Because listen, folks, uh, <clears throat> if you're going to do things that prepare you uh, uh, while you wait for that moment when you stand before the Lord, you want to be following the right people. That's a good word for the world in which we live because following is what a lot of people do today, whether on their social media, again, or on their news feeds or any of that other stuff. They're following somebody, and where is that person or people or that group leading you? That's a good question, isn't it? Right. 
Have you ever thought about if you stopped following these people on your social media account or on your news feed or on your, on your smartphone, what would you be doing? Where would you be going? <clears throat> I, like to, uh, I like to keep track of people uh, who do beekeeping. By the way, I enjoy beekeeping. I got stung in the wrist the other day. And it was, it, was, it was definitely not a mean moment. I mean, that bee did not mean to sting me, okay? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> right here in the wrist. My wrist started to swell up. My hand started to swell up. That night, I think it was Thursday night, my hand hurt so bad. I woke up multiple times in the night because the sheets touched my wrist. That's how bad it hurt. Oh, that was the most painful sting I've ever gotten in my life. That was free information for you, by the way. We're moving on. But I watch people who do beekeeping. They influence my beekeeping. You know, such and such guy does this manipulation or he uses this kind of, uh, you know, uh, strain of bee or this kind of thing. And I'm like, oh, man, I need to do that. I'm having that same problem. Okay, that, that changes the way I do things. And listen, in any area of our life, it's the same thing. The people you follow, the, 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 the information that they give you will affect you. And you've got to make a choice on who you follow. I think the people of faith are people worth following. Paul's, Timothy, Silas's. I think they're, I think they're worth following. You'd say, why? Let me give you a handful of reasons why. Verse number five, it says that they, uh, they, had, they were gospelers. Verse 5 says, for our gospel came unto you, not in word only. So they, these were men who would come into a community. Uh, they would preach the gospel. These were people who believed in the gospel. You know what that means? They cared about people. Right. Let me tell you, my friend, the more you watch the news, the more you pay attention to politics, the more you realize this. 99% of those politicians don't care one lick about anybody but themselves. Now, there is within the context of that group, probably the rare exception, but a majority of them care not for you and not for me, okay? All of them care about the money that the people are putting in their pockets. And listen, that's not a politics problem. Uh, that's a problem with humanity, right? That's a people problem, because we all have that same tendency. At the end of the day, we're worried about ourselves, right? When my kids come to me and they say, Dad, can you do this? Dad, can you do that? I always process that request through, is this good for me in this moment? Do I really want to get out of my chair and take them on a four-wheeler ride? Or do I really want to stop the thing that I am enjoying doing so that I can get involved in their lives? And I have to make a choice in that moment, right? And these men were gospelers, and they made a commitment to get involved in people's lives, to upset the normal flow of their life, to get out of the secular and get into the spiritual. People of faith make those decisions all the time. In our home, we've been spending a lot of time reading through different um, uh, missionary stories on the Saint family. You might be familiar with Nate Saint. He was a missionary pilot down in Ecuador. And uh, he was killed uh, by the Aka Indians. And we've read the story of, of him, and now we've just finished the story of his sister, Rachel Saint. And we're being impacted. These are people who, uh, Rachel Saint, who could, have, who could have lived an extravagant life, had a, had a woman uh, who wanted Rachel Saint to be her, her inheritance, uh, a, a young lady who would, who would get her inheritance, because this woman was a widower, she had no kid, or a widow, she had no kids. And she needed somebody to give her multi-million dollar inheritance to. And she came to Rachel Saint one day and she said, listen, if you'll spend the rest of your life uh, learning me and learning the things that I do so that you can take my inheritance and do something with it, I'll give it to you. And Rachel Saint had a huge decision to make. I mean, imagine if somebody came to you at the age of whatever, early, late teens, early 20s, and said, you know, if you'll just become uh, a person who, who learns from me, then I'm going to give you a multi-million dollar inheritance. And she prayed and said, Lord, what should we do with this whole thing? And God gave her a vision for uh, a group of native, uh, of uh, uh, people in the jungle. Uh, she, she, she called them her people. And they were naked people. It was, <laughs> that's what she said, these naked, a vision of naked people that said, come and give us the gospel. And she told us one, she says, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I've got to get to my people. 
See, the, those are people of faith. People who care more about the gospel and care more about getting the gospel to lost people. And, and she gave up a multi-million dollar inheritance to go to the jungles and, and eat bugs and monkey brains and all this weird stuff. And, and reach a group of people who killed each other for really absolutely no reason. Just a fascinating story. But these are people of faith. These are not people who are living for themselves. They're, they're living of the gospel. And those who preach the gospel need to live of the gospel. They need to live a sacrificial life. These are people worth following, my friend. They're gospelers. And, and, and in verse number 5, it says that their gospel came in power, which tells us that they were people of power. They weren't just people going out, throwing gospel tracts wherever. They were people who came, and when they presented the gospel, there was power behind that gospel message. They had, they had the hand of God on their lives. They had a real relationship and, and walked with God. It says that uh, in verse 5, in, in power and in the Holy Ghost, they had the hand of God on their lives. They discipled people. They came in, and, and uh, uh, Paul and Timothy and, and Silas, they, they spent time there, and they worked with them. They gave them the gospel. They, they had the Spirit of God on their lives. They, they had ministry opportunities, and, the, and they took advantage of them, and they invested in people. They were willing to set aside the comforts of this world, set aside all the extravagance of this world, because they were living for another moment. They weren't living for a paycheck. They weren't living for social, uh, 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 you know, social uh, uh, accolades. They were living for the judgment seat, my friend. While they were waiting for this moment, they were investing in it. Chapter 2 tells us more of these men. They were willing to suffer for the gospel. In verse number 2, after we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. And, and uh, uh, they, these men were, were beaten, were stoned everywhere they went. Verse 4 of chapter 2, they were not man-pleasers. They were allowed of God, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God. They didn't care what people said about them anymore. They didn't care what people had to say. They didn't care about what people uh, uh, you know, bickered about them behind uh, uh, you know, closed doors or uh, wherever. Don't we today care more about what people think about us really than what God does? Making sure to note, you know, oh, so-and-so doesn't like me. I've got to figure out how to, you know. I was at a Brewer game last year, and there was a guy named... Uh, some late night talk show, Colbert guy or something like that. Uh, he was on his apology tour and he had to come to Milwaukee because he said some really mean statements, I guess, about people in Milwaukee. I don't know, it happened right in front of us. All I know this is that everybody that was there came up and booed him. <laughs> Poor guy, I felt bad for him. Uh, but why was he there? Why was he saying these things? Because he cared about his ratings on his late night show. He didn't want to upset the apple cart. He didn't want people to, to think negative about him. So he was going to get out and go on his apology tour and go around and say sorry for all the wrong things that he had said. Listen, these guys are not men who are saying sorry because they came into a community and preached the gospel. They're not ashamed of the gospel. They don't care what people say. Because listen, the enemy is going to find people who will say mean things about you if you become a gospeler. When you're a man or a woman of faith, they were living unto God and they were living free. Not only become a follower of the people of faith, but notice in verse number six, they became followers of us. Again, they made a decision. They were going to follow people, uh, these Thessalonians. Uh, they were going to follow these men of faith, but also it says, and of the Lord. And, and this is great because it's, it, it, you know, they, they made a decision. Hey, we're going to follow what these guys are doing. They're setting forth a good pattern. We're going to mimic what they're doing. But what were Paul and Silas and, and Timothy doing? They were following God. So what were these guys going to do? What were the Thessalonians going to do? They were going to follow God. We're going to mimic them. We're going to follow their faith. We're not going to follow them because they're not gods. We're going to follow what they're doing. Do you know without faith it is impossible to please God? That's a fascinating statement, isn't it? You say, Pastor Weber, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm working up there in the years. Yeah, me too, been there, working on it. 
Okay, every day I wake up with a new ache. I'm not that old. At least I don't think I am yet. But I'm coming to grips with it. I'm getting older. Okay, things aren't working as they used to. We saw, yes, yesterday was our anniversary, and my wife played the video of our wedding. And I thought, who are these people? That's only 11 years ago, and I look so different. Having kids really messes you up. It's, really, it's just having kids. It takes, was it seven years off your life for every one of them or something like that? It doesn't matter how old you are, my friend. Without faith, it's impossible to please, to please him. If, today, listen, if you're here in 70 plus, you still, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You say, well, Pastor Weber, I'm, I'm too young. You know, I'm a little one. My four-year-old came up to me here. I don't know if you noticed him as the service was getting started. And he said, Daddy, God's talking to me today. I said, man, you just got to trust him by faith. But why would you say that to your four-year-old? Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. It doesn't matter if you're four, you're 40, <clears throat> or you're 70 plus. The statement is not applicable to only a certain realm of people. Right. It's for everybody. Amen. But in the converse, remember this, that with faith, all things are possible. Right. Because that's what pleases him. So we've got, we've got the people of faith, and then we have this God who wants to draw us to him by faith, right? So he's saying, follow people of faith and follow God, the God of faith. Jesus said, follow me, right? In Matthew chapter, was it 4, like verse 19, 20? Follow me, right? That's what he told the disciples. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That sounds like a good theme verse for a fishing guide group. If you know fishing, anybody who does fishing guide. Like, sorry. <laughs> Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He doesn't say, I'm going to make you a fisher of man. He says, Follow me. That's the command. And when you're following me, then I will make you a fisher of men. Which, what does this tell us? It tells us that these people of faith were following God. And it, what to do while you wait from, from God and when you wait for the judgment seat is to follow people of faith. Mimic the things that they're doing. Why? Because chances are those people are following God. And when you're following God, God's doing something. He's transforming your life. Amen. Follow me is the command. I will make is the follow-up is what happens. He also says to go, doesn't he? He says, you can't do this. You can't follow me sitting still. Uh, did, did Jesus ever, you ever follow Jesus' uh, short ministry life, right? Jesus, where do you sleep? <laughs> what, did, what did they say? What did he say? He says, everybody's got a place to sleep but me. Right? Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Right? Why? Because the time is short and the work is great. And the opportunities abound. He says there's too much to do, too many places to go. We've got too many excuses. When he's saying go, we're saying, whoa. I'm not ready for that yet. I, I can't go there. I, I can't do that. Listen, you, you, that's fine. But that's not what you do while you wait. When Jesus says go, you say, yes, sir. Amen. You say, where? I mean, again, go down to people in the, in, the, in the hall of faith. You go down the Hebrews 11 passage, all the different decisions that men and women made in those passages, all the way down to the end is fascinating. Abraham, uh, probably one of the biggest ranching organizations ever in the history of the world. And God said, come out of, come out of Ur. I've got a place that I'm going to show you. What? Leave my family? Leave everything? Walk away from our family farm and our, and our ranching heritage and all this stuff? You mean walk away from this stuff? Yep, pack it up. It's time to go. Yes, sir. Build a boat. No. <laughs> a what? A boat. What is a boat? And what are they for? You know, it never rained in Noah's day. 
They didn't have lakes. They didn't go fishing. They didn't do any of that kind of stuff. But don't, don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll show you what an ark is. You just build what I tell you to build. Yes, sir. Right? And, and that, that's the response that God's looking for from, from the people who are making decisions. But again, it's a personal decision, my friend. Who are you following? Because God might ask you to do something, but you're so tied up, busy following these people over here and doing this thing over here, that when God says go, you're, you're too distracted. You say, whoa, I don't have time for this. This upsets my life too much. I'm, I'm not interested in that right now. I mentioned I had two things I wanted to share with you this morning. Number one, what to do while you wait. Become a follower. Follow people of faith. The Pauls, the Timothys, the Silases, the Lord. Number two, what to do while you wait? Be an example. Be a follower and be an example. That's what he says here in uh, verse number seven. So that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Be an example, right? Notice it says down there a little further in the verse number eight, he says that your faith to Godward is spread abroad. It was, it was the idea here that their faith was just being cast out all over the place. I had a really weird experience the other day. I had a farmer friend come over and till up, some, till up a patch for a, a, a food plot. <laughs> and uh, he says, hey, you need my little seed spreader thing? And I thought, no, I don't need that little seed spreader thing. I'll just, I'll just kind of broadcast the seed out. We're going to put down some turnips and all that stuff for the deer. And uh, it's not like they don't have enough to eat around our property. They eat the farmer's corn and soybeans and all that other stuff. So I'm just going to give them a little snack to eat while they're waiting in front of my tree stand. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> I thought, man, this is really silly. Why, why would I do this? I should have a spreader thing. Like, I shouldn't have said no. I sh so I got out my little, uh, my little lawn fertilizer thing. And I went down there, and I put my seed in there, and I have to figure out the adjustments on it. And then I'm trying to walk, and it's bumpy, and I'm pushing this stuff. And it was really hard. I thought, man, this is, this is silly. I should have just got the thing, and I could have just walked and did it the right way. But you know me. I like to learn things the hard way. So uh, anyway, I was trying to spread abroad the seed, and it was really hard. And I'm sure when that stuff grows up, there will be a big patch right here, and then there will be nothing right there, and then there will be a big patch over here. But it's really easy for God when he has people who are following him to get their testimony out. It's not complicated for God. He, he can spread it like wildfire. Example there, the idea of uh, being an example to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia is a pattern, a model to follow. Just as Paul and uh, Silas and Timothy were a model uh, and the Thessalonians were to mimic or model their life after them, uh, they become a model for us. And we should be modeling and mimicking our lives after what we read right here in the Word of God. And we should be surrounding our lives with people and insulating ourselves with people who live like people in the Word of God. Let me give you a few things here that being an example of faith, it does a couple of things. Number one, it impacts a region. Notice it says, be an example to all that are Macedonia and Achaia. Again, this is Thessalonica. So this is on a, a coastal town. This is a community that is probably a port community. And uh, they're, they're up there in, in uh, Macedonia uh, area. Uh, but this isn't just, they're not just impacting Thessalonica. They're impacting the region of Macedonia. But not just that, south into Achaia. So this is a uh, Corinthian area, okay, down in the Greek, Greek area and Greece area. Uh, they're impacting that whole region, okay? Listen, when you're following God and when you're following people of faith uh, and you become a person who's modeling and patterning your life after a, a person of faith, you become an example for somebody else to follow, Okay? And when, when that happens, it begins to spread. This is what we call multiplication. It's a lot different than addition, okay? Addition's just adding people. This is multiplying. This is, this is 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, you know, uh, the, uh, commit thou to faithful men ministry here. This is when we say, listen, uh, I'm going to model my life after somebody who's living by faith, and I'm going to invest in somebody who then could invest in somebody. 
Okay, that's the Great Commission, my friend. And when you have faith and you're being uh, an example of, of faith to follow, you're going to have an impact on a region, not just on a pew. What is the purpose of our gathering together here? I mean, again, I ask that question to, to cause us to think, what is the reason we get together? Why go to church on Sunday? You know, that's what a lot of people have said, and they said, I don't know why. Then let's not go. Okay. That's why this church was 300, 400, whatever it was, and now it's not. It's because a lot of people said, you know what, forget it. Why go? Why be a part of the gathering together again? Why do that every week? What's the point? To keep the lights on? To keep the air flowing? I contend that there is a reason to gather together. And it's not to keep the lights on or the air flowing or the carpets clean. Or to keep the kids busy with something to do while the rest of us sit here and talk about the Bible. I believe it's, we're, we're to be working together for a purpose. And Ephesians chapter number 4 says we should be doing the work of the ministry. Which Jesus says is impacting our community and the communities around us with the gospel. Discipling people. Investing in lives. Preparing while we wait for that moment when we see Jesus. Why do you come to church? I had a, uh, we were in our last ministry at the church plant there in Shano. I thought, you know what, I'm going to try to get people to stop coming to church. Stop coming to church. Stop giving. That's what I tell them. Why? What's the point of giving? If it's not of faith, then don't do it. If you're not here to get, get involved in what we're doing, then why come? Is it just a checklist item? Pastor Weber, don't do that. People might not come back. Listen, if the heart's not in it, why be here anyway? If we're not here for the purpose, then why be here? Listen, if I were playing on a baseball team today, let's say I were praying for the, for the brewers. <coughs> the loggers. <laughs> I could play for the brewers. I could. I could do better than Christian Yelich. He's, on, he's doing pretty well. But I can, I can hit better than he can, maybe. We'll get in the batting cage and find out one day, maybe. But anyway, if I were there and all my time I was thinking about playing football or croquet or tennis, <laughs> okay, they'd be like, what are you doing here? Your, your, your head's not in it. Your heart's not in it. You're affecting the whole team. See, that's what I'm saying, folks. These men, their heart was in it. They were committed. They wanted to be examples to another generation. They wanted to show them what it looked like when people really gave themselves to the work of the ministry. And if we're going to become an example while we wait to stand before our Lord, then we need to be the kind of people that have faith that impacts a region, that we're here for a reason. We're not here just to have another building program. We're not here just to have another church activity, although they can be really fun. <laughs> right, Brother Miller? <laughs> we're excited about those moments. But listen, there's a reason we gather together. It's to impact our community with the gospel. Number two. Be an example of faith, faith that not just only impacts a region, but develops a real relationship with God. Verse 9, it says, For they themselves show us uh, what manner of entering in we had among you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So they, they went from pagan religion uh, to casting off all of that, seeing the example of Paul and Silas, to impacting a region and committing their hearts to worshiping the true and only God. What does it mean to have a real relationship with God, my friend? You know, that's why a lot of people come to church is because they think, you know, if I come to church, it shows God that I'm worthy to go to heaven. That has nothing to do with it. A real relationship with God has to do with unconditional love. Trust. Honesty. A lot of people are offended by some of the things that I say. That's okay. I'm just trying to be honest with you. Honesty is the best way to get to an answer 
is to get to a solution. God's looking for honesty today from us. Notice their re real relationship with God, this commitment to this real relationship. Uh, was an, it, They wanted to be an example of faith, so they were willing to invest in this relationship no matter what the cost. But it led them somewhere. It led them to service. It, it says that they, um, um, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So it, it, this, this real relationship with God, this opportunity to have this genuine relationship wasn't self, uh, it wasn't for self. It, it wasn't self-consuming. It was, it was an outflow ministry. It was, okay, I'm going to have this real relationship with God because there's people to impact there's a region to impact. There's, there's people at church that need encouragement. There's, there's people in my sphere of influence that need Christ. There's things happening in my life where they need God, and God wants me to be that channel. If I were to have you put your social media feed on a large live screen up here, would your social media feed exhibit service to God? Would your social media feed give us the impression that you're out there having a real relationship with Jesus and that you're looking to influence people around your life with that real relationship with, with God, that you're, you're looking to serve the true and living God, you're looking to be an encouragement and a help. See, because being an example of faith not only impacts a region, but it develops a real relationship with God that's going somewhere. It's not self-consuming. Verse 10, being an example of faith gets us back to where we started. Lives with the judgment seat of Christ in view. See, because at the end of the day, we have to keep coming back to the reality that the next stop on this ride is to stand before the Lord. Whether you like that or not, or whether you agree with the things I'm saying or not, it, it, that, none of that matters, because the reality is what's true is that there's coming a time, and it could be today, and it could be tomorrow, it could be the next day that you or I or any one of us are going to stand before the Lord. Right. And nobody's going to stand next to you, not on your left or not on your right. Nobody's going to carry you into that moment. All of us will give an account of themselves. And these men in, uh, were, were living, Paul and Sylvanius and Timothy, were living with the judgment seat in view. Every moment they put it on their, uh, you know, on their, on the, uh, you know, the front of their heart, on the, you know, however they did that. Uh, they prayed it through, whatever it was. And they were able to transfer that to, to the Thessalonican believers and say, hey, listen, if you live like we're living, then you're going to live knowing that there's coming a time very shortly in your life. And, and I can't tell you what day it is, but it's coming and it'll be here before you know it. You're going to stand before the Lord. So here's what you do until you get to that moment. Live like us and follow Jesus. So you've been wondering this whole time, these last several weeks, we've been talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Pastor, what do we do till we wait? Be a follower. Follow people of faith. Follow the God of faith. And then be an example. Be somebody that somebody else can model their life after. That will help them be a follower of people of faith and the God of faith. And when, when, you, when you do that, you're preparing yourself while you wait to meet your Savior. And when you get there, it'll be the most glorious moment of your life. My friend, are you ready for the judgment seat of Christ? Are you living in anticipation of that moment? You can be. If you're a follower. And if you're an example. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the privilege you give us to gather together this morning from the word of life. And uh, we thank you this morning that, uh, that
that the law of liberty sets us free. Lord, help us to be delivered of the things, uh, even this morning, that hinder us from preparing to stand before you at that time. It should be so exciting, so glorious. Uh, Lord, in areas where we're following the wrong people, Lord, deliver us. Lord, in areas where we're being a bad example, Lord, deliver us. And Lord, in the areas where we, where we are following the right people, Lord, or, or we are being a good example, Lord, encourage us. And Lord, fan the flame uh, of that reality for, for other people. But Lord, surely there's many here this morning that need to make a decision to live with the judgment seat of Christ in view. And I pray this morning, Lord, that they would come willing to make a decision to follow different people and to be a better example of a faith-filled Christian to the people around them. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you stand with me to your feet if you don't mind this morning? I'm going to ask the pianist to play through his invitation song this morning. We won't take long, but we will take a minute to let God work in hearts. And this morning, if God spoke to you very specifically about some area of your life that God's dealing with you, maybe about following the wrong people, or maybe about being an example that you shouldn't be, and you want to come this morning and deal with that issue, the altar will be open. Or maybe God's doing some things in your heart. You just need to make a decision. Maybe it's a decision of faith this morning for you and your family. Would you come this morning and talk to the Lord about it? Whatever it is this morning, my friend, the altar is open, the piano is playing, you come. Father, thank you again for the privilege to gather together around the word of life, for the opportunity that you give us in this day and age to hear from you. And Lord, even in this public setting, Lord, many countries around the world, we couldn't even do this meeting. So Lord, thank you for the privilege to gather publicly and to be a Christian publicly. Lord, help us to take advantage of that right now in the time in which you've given us. Bless, Lord, as we go. We'll thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight at 7 o'clock.